Good morning. Welcome to Salem. Uh, last night about 10 o'clock, I got back home from Rapid City, South Dakota, a trip four years ago I said I would never do again. But God has a way of working. And it was amazing that as doors close up there for events that we had planned for the kids, how other doors opened up for us. And the highlight of the week was that Friday night at Council Park when I saw 12 kids give their life to Christ. And we went out there, we prayed with the kids, and it was just a joy to see that God has worked that way all week long. And he does have a way of working and turning things out. I'm going to ask that you join me in prayer this morning as we thank him for what we have. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything you give to us. I thank you for a week that I didn't think I'd ever spend again. The ways that you work and show us your, your blessings is, is in awe. And as we go into the meeting today, Lord, we ask that the words of our mouth, the music, and the meditation of our heart and the preaching be to, be to you and you alone for this we pray. Amen. Mark. We'll start our singing with number 66 in the blue hymnal. We'll worship the king. Let's thank our song. Number 66. And then turn over to 514. 
right, good morning everyone. Now is the time for any prayer requests that we might have or any announcements, if, uh, if anyone has any. Um, I believe Scott has the mic. I just want to make a short announcement on behalf of the elders. The elders met this past Wednesday, and a good portion of our meeting was spent discussing our response to the resolution from the Mennonite Church USA delegate meeting in May. And the main resolution in question that we were discussing called for a confession to LGBT Mennonites who have been hurt by the church. And this resolution also included a series of commitments to include LGBT leaders and theology in Mennonite Church USA. And this resolution passed with 55% approval. Uh, so a couple of things that uh, we've heard and we wanted to uh, address or that the elders have heard, people have talked to them about. Um, first, this is a resolution that has commitments at the denominational level, but it does not change our beliefs here at Salem or force us to do anything differently here at our church. We will continue to live by our convictions that marriage is between one man and one woman. Second, some people have expressed concern about their money going to Mennonite Church USA, and none of the money given in the regular offering goes to Mennonite Church USA. Only money given to Central Plains special offerings is channeled to the denomination. Third, uh, this resolution puts MCUSA in a different position from our congregation. We had some meetings before uh, the delegate meeting in May, and heard very strongly that, that our church believes in, in one man, one woman marriage, not unanimously, but pretty strongly. And so this uh, resolution raises important questions about how we fit in this denomination. So responding to this resolution is something that the elders have determined should happen soon, but we also feel like we have time to make sure we, we do it well and think through it. And we don't feel like we have to rush through this because we're still op free to operate as we see fit on this issue. So with that said, um, in the next couple of weeks, hopefully by next week, uh, we'll be giving you a summary of the resolution again and its impact. And we'll have the full resolution available for anybody that wants to read it again. I know it's been a while since you might have seen it and might be helpful to, to reintroduce yourself to it. And then we want to hear from the congregation. You can imagine the elders have our own opinions about what we think the response should be, but we want to hear from you. So you will have the opportunity to share a written response, and you will also have the chance to share in a public forum in the upcoming months. So at our July elders meeting, which will be towards the end of the month, uh, we will be deciding on the questions for a written questionnaire and after a couple of weeks to gather that data, we'll have a meeting either in one big group or in a series of smaller groups. But we want you to know that the ball is rolling and we will want to hear from you all soon. So we ask for your prayers as we lead this process. We ask for God's guidance and wisdom and a spirit of charity towards each other in the congregation. And as always, myself and any of the elders are available to talk about this resolution and how we're moving forward with our response. Thank you. All right, does anyone else have anything? Scott has the mic. I'd like to uh, ask, ask you to remember my son-in-law, Caleb Hendrickson. Uh, last Saturday they were kayaking and he had an accident of some sort and tore up his knee and had, went, had stitches and then on uh, Monday went back to, the, to uh, get it checked out and they put him in the hospital. He had an infection in his knee and he's had uh, two surgeries now and he's still in the hospital. I know uh, Judy's up there but she's coming back this evening and uh, so I just ask for your prayer for healing and for uh, Katie's family. I guess I'd like to ask for prayer for our nation and its leadership. If 
no one else has anything, we'll go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you that it's your day, the day that you've set aside for us, a day that we can rest from our toils and from our worries, a day that we can gather together with our brothers and sisters and with your Holy Spirit, a day that we can celebrate and remember what you've done on our behalf. Today we rejoice that you came the first time to save us from our sins that we could be forgiven. And we also look forward to the next time that you're going to come to set up your kingdom, to make all things new, and to rule and reign forever. Lord, today we lift up all of our concerns to you, and whether I mention them now or not, we just pray that we know that you know what we need before we even ask. And so just hear our hearts, as well as our prayers, Lord. We lift up the situation in the Ukraine. We just pray that peace would be forthcoming. Lord, I pray that you'd protect the innocents there. Pray, pray your protection on your people in particular. And Lord, I just pray that cooler heads would prevail as it pertains to the governments and, and the, the armies. Lord, we lift up our nation we feel so much from every side, Lord, turmoil, whether it's political, whether it's geopolitical, whether it's economic, whether it's government, Lord, whatever it is, there's many things, many things going on currently, Lord, that we are all concerned about. We just pray for your peace to overcome it all. We pray for our leaders, Lord, that they can turn back to you, Lord, and to make good decisions on behalf of all of us, Lord. We pray for Salem here, Lord, we, our church. We ask your blessing on the offerings, Lord, the general offering as well as the offering for the um, Waddingtons, Lord. Just I pray that your blessing on the people that are giving to those. And Lord, I just pray that both those offerings would be used to, to build and to further your kingdom. We lift up the people with special days this week. Birthdays including Nadia Kemp, Josephine Knoll, Marlon Knoll, Angie Lederach, Keith Lauber, Mary Garman, Matthew Troyer Miller, Cindy Batty, and Hillary Kennel. Lord, I pray that you'd be with each and every one of those people this week as they celebrate. We thank you for the time that they've had and the time that they have left, Lord. Just bless them beyond measure on their day. We also lift up those with anniversaries this week. Reg and Monica Knoll, Chris and Jackie Schwarzendruber, <coughs> Dan and Julia Bossart, Aaron and Amy Schwarzendruber, Greg and Bethany Schlegel, and Josh and Steph Schwarzendruber Snyder. Lord, we thank you for the institution of marriage and for these that have um, put themselves into that institution. Lord, we just ask your blessing on all of those unions and Lord, just uh, help them to draw near to each other and draw near to you as well. Lord, we lift up Aaron Powell as he's in the Middle East right now. We pray, Lord, your protection and your hand upon him. We pray that he can be a light where he's needed to be light. And Lord, that you would just return him safely to his family in due time. We pray for Dan and Julia Bossart as they're heading to Africa here for pretty soon. We just pray your protection as they travel and while they're there. Lord, would you prepare the soils in front of their ministry, Lord, that it might be a successful mission trip. And Lord, that your name may be great um, as they go and spread the word. Prepare their hearts, Lord, for the work that they're going to do in Jesus' name. <laughs> Lord, I lift up Caleb Hendrickson to you, Lord, with the situation with his leg and his knee, I just pray first your healing upon him. Lord, you know exactly what needs to happen, and I just pray for wisdom with the doctors, and Lord, that his body would respond to all the treatments and that you'd return him to being whole. And Lord, I pray for his family as well during the difficult time while he's in the hospital. Just uh, be with them. 
and give them confidence in you, Lord, above all else. Lord, I pray for our church as we discuss the, the resolution upcoming in the upcoming months, Lord. You promised that you would give your peace, not as the world gives, but your peace that uh, surpasses our understanding, Lord. And so let that be a part. And I just pray your unity among our, our body here, Lord, as we seek to discern what your will is for our congregation. And Lord, undoubtedly there are many needs unspoken here among us this morning, and I just pray that, you, again, you'd minister to each of those as well. I pray you'd, we invite your Holy Spirit to be among us, Lord, as we continue to worship you today. And Lord, um, just let us feel that presence. We ask all these things in the mighty name that is above every name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Turn in your blue hymnals again to 151, the marvelous grace of our loving Lord, 151. Our scripture this morning comes from 1 Corinthians 11, starting with 17 and go through 34. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt, there have to be differences among among you to show which of you have God's approval. When you come together, it, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat, for as you eat, each of you go ahead and head without waiting for anyone else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God 
and humiliate those who have nothing. What should I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. For I received from the Lord what I have passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the, the, drink, the bread or drinks a, cu a cup of the Lord in an awful manner will be guilty of sin and before the body and, and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. For if we judge ourselves, we will not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are doing dis discipline so that with we will not be condemned with the world. So this, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anyone is hungry, he should go home, should eat at home, so that when you meet together, it would, may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further directions. Pastor Ben. Thank you, Leroy. And as Chris mentioned just a minute ago, uh, Dan and Julia are actually on their way to Kenya right now. They were leaving about 4 o'clock this morning. So uh, just like to ask a blessing on them for their travels and we'll also say a blessing for the message. So Lord, we thank you so much for being here with us this morning, that we can meet you here in our worship and in prayer and in the message. And God, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would continue to move among us here this morning. God, we also ask that your spirit would be with Dan and Julia and with their group as they are traveling. We pray for safety as they go, and God, we just ask that you would protect them spiritually as well. Um, Lord, let them be a, a light, uh, not just in Kenya, but each step along the way, everywhere that they go and every person that they meet and interact with. Uh, just may the light of Christ shine through them and be on their faces. Jesus, we pray these things in your mighty name. Amen. When have you received an unexpected gift from someone, and what did it mean to you? Usually if you receive an unexpected gift, it, it, it hits you in a special kind of way. Well, a few years ago, Sarah and I and the boys were driving across country roads in Indiana to a nearby town to meet some friends to go roller skating. The boys were pretty young. This was probably four or five years ago. And this was a, a big deal that, that we were doing this. And so we, we pulled up to a stop sign on one of these country roads, and I came to a complete stop. I looked left, and I looked right, and I looked left again, and there was nobody coming. And this doesn't end in an accident. But I, I pushed on the accelerator to go through the intersection, and the van goes 10 miles an hour, and 15, and 20, and 25, and 25, and 25, no matter how hard I stepped on that accelerator, we weren't going any faster than 25. The van would not shift into second gear, the transmission was gone. So I pulled over into a nearby, there was a farmhouse and a hog building there, and so we pulled into that driveway. And Sarah and I started to make a plan. What are we going to do? Our van is stranded here on this country road. We're not close to anything. We knew we needed a new transmission, and that was going to be expensive, but we could make it work. Of more concern to us at the moment was we had two young children in the van, and what are we going to do with them? And we have a vehicle that doesn't work. How are we going to get this delivered to where it needs to go? 
It was a stressful night. It is not one that I would want to relive anytime soon, but at the same time, I actually have some fond memories of that night and that blown transmission. Because through that experience, we received three unexpected gifts. First of all, Sarah called the friends that we were supposed to meet that evening to tell them that we would no longer be meeting them. They already had a crew of kids themselves, but they came to where we were at to pick up Sarah and the boys. And because of the delay, they didn't have any chance to make it to the roller skating rink, but they did end up at McDonald's for ice cream and for fun at the play place. That didn't turn out too bad. That was the first gift that we received from that blown transmission. Next, the friend who was coming to pick up Sarah and the boys called another friend of ours and told him what was going on and asked if he could help us tow our van to the mechanic. So about half an hour after Sarah and the boys were picked up, our van was hooked up by a tow strap behind this guy's pickup. And 45 minutes later, we were in the parking lot at our mechanic's shop. It was now late, and we had missed supper, so we stopped at Wendy's to grab a bite to eat. And when I took out my wallet to pay for it, he told me to put it away. This was his gift to me, and he wouldn't let me repay him for it. That was the second gift, unexpected gift we received from that. The next morning, I called the mechanic tell him what our vehicle was doing in his parking lot and to try to find out what the damage was going to be. He said it's probably in the range of about $3,000 for a new transmission and the van was still in pretty good shape, not overly high in miles, so we told him to go ahead and do the work. He called back a day or two later to tell us that the van was ready with the rebuilt transmission and we can come and pick it up anytime. So we drive to town to pick up the van, I walk into the shop, I pull out my debit card to pay the bill, and this time when I ask him what the charge is, it's several hundred dollars less than what it was the first time I talked to him. And I ask, was it less labor? Were you able to find a cheaper transmission? What's the deal that the estimate was so much higher than what the work actually was? No, he said, another friend of ours heard about the van and came in to pay for part of the work for us. And not just a little bit, but a pretty good chunk of change. And the mechanic was under instructions not to tell us who had done it, of course, although later we figured it out because he had made a note on our bill that had the guy's name. So this started out as a really negative event, and it was going to take quite an effort to figure our way out of it. Between getting Sarah and the boys whisked away, getting the van to the mechanic, how are we going to pay for it? But with these three unexpected gifts, what could have been a total nightmare was changed into an event that I remember fondly because of the people that came to our rescue. Now, in today's scripture, Paul is giving instructions to the Corinthian church about sharing the Lord's Supper. These letters that Paul wrote were given before any of the Gospels were written down. So this is the first teaching in 1 Corinthians 11 that we have about the Lord's Supper. It was probably written down about 25 years after Jesus lived and died. The Lord's Supper goes by different names depending on what church you're a part of. Sometimes it's called communion. Sometimes it's called the Eucharist, which means thanksgiving. Sometimes it's called a love feast. Sometimes it's called mass. But whatever name it goes by, the breaking of bread and the sharing of the cup is a remembrance that Jesus died for us and he lives with us each and every day. This passage is special because it is the first teaching that we have about the Lord's Supper. It's a meal that was celebrated not that long after Jesus ascended into heaven, and it's a meal we still celebrate 2,000 years later. What a special connection this meal is to the early church and to Christ himself. So before the Lord's Supper is anything, it is a reminder to us of the unexpected gift of grace we've been given through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
It's a gift of grace because we were in a nightmare scenario, much worse than having blown a transmission out in the country. We were in a nightmare scenario before we knew Christ. Sin always wrecks havoc. First of all, in our life here on earth, but also, of course, on our eternal lives. Sin affects our life on earth because it steals the power and the wisdom and the love and peace and joy of God that we can have in this life when we know Christ. Throughout the Bible, God says to his people in different ways, if you leave behind your old ways and you live in relationship with me, it will go well with you. It might not always be easy, but I will be with you, and it will go well with you if you live according to my ways. But when we stray from God's ways, sin always takes away these good gifts that God wants us to have here on earth. Beyond that, sin is a nightmare because it's a threat to our eternal life. God has given us this life, our our physical life, to find Christ, and through him to deal with our sin. And so if life ends without us receiving salvation through Jesus, then that nightmare becomes a reality. And it leads to people being separated from God forever if Jesus is not their Savior. But the Lord's Supper, the sharing of the bread and the juice, the remembering of Jesus' death, in which he freely gave himself for us, In this meal, we experience the power of Jesus. The Lord's Supper is the prompt that we have over and over and over. Every time we share it, that Jesus rescued us from our nightmare of being in sin. And Jesus doesn't do one part of it. It took three friends to come and, and help us out of our nightmare. Jesus does every part of what it takes us from sin, give us salvation. There is only one Savior who can deliver us from our sin. The Lord's Supper is intended to be a celebration of new life that we have in Christ. And that new life, if you think about the cross, new life has a, hor- or a, a vertical dimension and a horizontal dimension. The vertical dimension connects us to Christ through the Lord's Supper And the horizontal dimension connects us to each other, to our brothers and sisters in Christ here on earth. The vertical part is our relationship with God. It's a, a personal thing between me and him. It's a relationship in which we communicate as friends, and I worship God in awe and reverence. God watches over me and gives me strength to live, and I serve God with an attitude of obedience, And I confess my sins when I need to confess my sins. And because Jesus talks about being the vine and we are the branches, we are his fruitful disciples when we are connected to him in this vertical relationship. At communion, we are reminded that our relationship with God is important and that we have it because of the sacrifice of Jesus who has made us right with God and connected us to him. But the communion meal is not just vertical in nature. It also connects us to each other. It's a celebration of who we are together in Christ. It's a horizontal relationship because I'm connected not just to God, but I am connected to God's people. Sometimes people have uh, talked about the Lord's Supper like a family reunion in which we share uh, memories and share traits and we share identity with those who are gathered with us. So we all share grandma's nose or grandpa's sense of humor. These family gatherings are where we tell the stories about how grandpa and grandma survived on very little but created a good home. Or we remember that things weren't always so great, but we find ourselves stronger because we have each other to go through these things with. The communion table, in the same way, is an ongoing reminder that this is our family. These are my brothers and sisters. And at the communion table, we tell the one story that draws all of us together, the story of this free gift of grace we have received that took us out of the nightmare of sin and has delivered us into new life in Christ. 
And it's in this horizontal relationship that Paul is very unhappy with the church in Corinth because he says when they come together for the Lord's Supper, some of them are coming to be gluttonous and drunk. This is serious stuff that Paul is talking about, and it has to do with how they're treating each other. When this church met for the Lord's Supper, it was more than just a little square of bread and a thimble full of juice. What Paul is talking about here, when they took the Lord's Supper, it, it was like gathering for a big feast. It was probably some kind of a potluck. And sometime during the course of the meal, or perhaps when it was over, someone from the church, maybe it was organized, maybe not, would break the bread and share the cup, and they would remember the Lord's death as part of this potluck meal that they were having together. And in doing so, they remember that they have received grace and they are in right relationship with God because of Christ. And because they have all received that grace, they are also called to be in relationship with each other. But instead of being a celebration of their oneness with each other because of what they're doing, the relationship with each other is broken through this meal. And because the horizontal relationship is broken, it's a clear indicator that something is also not right with their vertical relationship with God. Because when they gather to eat, some of the poor people can't get there right away. They, they're working, so they can't come to the meal when the rich people are wanting to have it. And so what was happening was these poor people would come to the meal and the rich people had already eaten all of the good food and drank the good drink and they were getting ready to leave just as the workers showed up at the church. What could have been a wonderful opportunity for them to overcome these boundaries and these distinctions between who was rich and who was poor in the church instead was causing humiliation to those who were on the, the lower end of society. They were using the Lord's Supper, this family reunion, to further humiliate and degrade the poor among them. And Paul says, this is shameful. This is to your shame what you're doing. Now, can you imagine coming to a potluck here at the church and you walk in the door and there's people everywhere and, and you're taking in all of the smells and you smell meats and vegetables and fresh bread and casseroles and you see the dessert table and you've brought your best, you've brought your very best de mi uh, dish to this meal and you want to share it and, and the host or the hostess comes to you and takes your dish with kind of an insincere raised eyebrow and just says, looks good, thanks for bringing it. That would probably be your first clue that something wasn't right. Then another person comes to you and hands you a piece of paper and you turn it over and there's a number three. You wonder, I wonder what this number three is. And so you ask, what does this mean? And they tell you, well, that means you get to eat from table number three. And you look at table number one where all the best food is and the best desserts and table number two and there's some good stuff there yet you could still fill yourself up at table number two but then you see table number three and there's barely anything there and and what's there doesn't look all that great it's kind of what's left from the meal and so you get what you can from table number three you manage to get a little bit in your belly but you leave the meal feeling unsatisfied your growling in your stomach reminds you that you didn't eat much, and the pit in your stomach reminds you that they didn't think you were good enough, and that you didn't fit in here. That's what the Corinthians were doing to each other. They were creating these divisions where some people were ranked higher than others in the church, where some ate and some went without, and some left church feeling worse about their place in life than if they had never shown up at all. So Paul reminds them to be careful about their vertical relationship to God and their horizontal relationship to each other, especially when they share the Lord's Supper. He tells them in verse 27, So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Now, a lot of times this verse is used at communion as a, a general kind of warning, a, a general call to look at your life and repent of any sin in your life. 
before you take communion. And that's not a bad thing at all. It's good to examine ourselves before communion. But usually that kind of examination has to do with our vertical relationship to God. What Paul was really talking about is look at how you're treating each other. Look at how your relationships are with your brothers and sisters when you share in the communion meal. So when he says, do not take of the supper in an unworthy manner, he's talking about how you treat each other in addition to your relationship to God. And Paul tells them, when you eat in this way, it's not those who you think are unworthy who are unworthy. When you are eating the meal in this way, when you're getting, eating all the good food and you're getting drunk before the poor can come, it is you who are behaving shamefully and acting in an unworthy manner. So then Paul gives them a warning about judgment that when they eat in an unworthy manner, they're inviting God's judgment on themselves. This isn't a judgment so much in the sense of you get what you deserve because none of us get what we deserve because God has shown us grace. But when they are treating each other in this way, they reveal their need to be disciplined. They, they reveal that they still have a lot of growth to become more like Jesus. In verse 32, Paul writes, we are being disciplined so that we will not finally be condemned with the world. So we see that Paul talks about God's discipline in this life is for the purpose of making us more like Jesus and preparing us for eternal life. Finally, Paul gives his last word of instruction about the Lord's Supper in verses 33 and 34. He says, when you gather to eat, everyone eat together so that it may not result in judgment. And Paul promises to give further direction to, him, to them when he comes. And I sure wish we had the rest of that teaching that Paul was going to give. So the church in Corinth has some things to work out and some sins to confess. And they need to get to loving each other the right way. Yet as painful as it was for those who were left out of the Lord's Supper, left out of the best parts of the feast, the Lord's Supper is still good news for them. Because even those who are rejected by the world, even those who have felt rejected in the church, those are men and women and boys and girls that Jesus Christ gave his life to save and to bring into his body. The Corinthians have to change the way that they live in order to better reflect the kingdom of God. Because there are none of these silly divisions in God's kingdom. At God's feast in heaven, there are not sections for rich and poor or worthy and unworthy, or stiff worshipers or loose worshipers. At God's table, there is no division between good and bad because everyone is on the same playing field. When you sit at God's table, when we all sit down at God's table in heaven, and you look at your name tag, there's going to be one label there. It's going to have your name, and it's going to say, Saved by Grace. It's not going to say how much money you make. It's not going to say what your batting average was when you were in seventh grade. It's not going to say what your grades were. Your name saved by grace. And that grace puts us all on the same playing field. So a couple of things I want to close with for today. First of all, if there is any hint of, of us feeling like we are better than any of our brothers and sisters, whether it's people in the church or Christians across in, in other churches, we need to examine that attitude within ourselves. If in our words and actions there's anything that might feel other people feel unworthy or unwelcome, then we need to, to ask God to examine our hearts, to show us where that is coming from, and to help us overcome it so that we are not turning anyone away, making anyone feel unworthy when they join us in worship. Instead, we need to ask God to help us see ourselves and everyone else with that same label, sinner saved by grace. You're not any better and you're not any worse, but we're all here because of Jesus. 
and only because of him. So make it your goal to pray when, for, for yourself when you struggle with these kinds of things, if you notice them starting to crop up within yourself. Second, if you have ever been hurt by people who have made you feel unwelcome or unworthy at the church, I want you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it does not reflect how Jesus feels about you. People are sinners, and churches are made up of people. So if you do the logic pattern, churches are never going to be perfect. We do our best to reflect Jesus, but we're not always going to get it right. And when we fail and when we make people feel like they don't belong here with us, we need to strive to do better. But Jesus is thrilled that you have received him and that you are a part of his body, even if others in the church have made you feel unwelcome. The church in Corinth, it wasn't their church to rule over. It wasn't theirs to make other people feel unworthy. It was Jesus' church, and it is still Jesus' church. And in Jesus' church, every sinner who repents and gives their life to him is welcome and worthy, even as we all work out our sins together. You are welcome in the church of Christ, and you're not here to just be a wallflower, but you're here to live and love and thrive as a part of Christ's body. Sometimes we have miscommunications that make people feel unwelcome. But anyone who would hold an attitude of looking down on you has, according to Paul, proved themselves to be unworthy at the Lord's table. So don't let the hang-ups of others convince you that you don't belong because you are a cherished and beloved child of God. And anything that you felt in your past at any church, know that Jesus loves you and is glad you're here. Finally, to just return briefly to the first part of the message. All of us were subject to a nightmare because of sin. We were torn apart from God in this life, and we were not going to be with God for eternity because of our sin. But because of what Jesus has done to us in giving us this unexpected gift of grace, each one of us is welcome in his kingdom and at his table. Jesus asked us to confess that we need him, recognize we can't do it ourselves, that we're not good people on our own, but with him, all things are possible. With him, we are saved by grace. With him, we can grow to become more like Jesus. You have been given this gift, this gift of grace, and because of that gift, Jesus has rescued you from the nightmare of sin. And no matter what your sin might be, because it's different from before all of us, whether it's greed or pride or addiction or anger or fits of rage or jealousy, division, envy, homosexual behavior, or any kind of heterosexual sinful behavior. When you receive Jesus, every sin is forgiven and you have the chance to start over new. Jesus has taken us out of a nightmare and brought us into the kingdom of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus, we are thankful for these words about the Lord's Supper that we have in the Bible to instruct us, to help us know how to celebrate the Supper, but to help us know how to live. Jesus, if there has ever been a time in our past where we might have made someone feel unwelcome or unworthy in the church by something we've done or said, whether it was intentional or accidental. Lord, we confess that. We ask you to help us notice these things in ourselves so that we can extend your grace and love and welcome to people who need to know you more. Jesus, for those of us who have been hurt by the church at some time in our life, God, I pray that that would not be an injury that would prevent people from coming to know you or would prevent people from coming to know your body of believers altogether. Lord, I pray that there might be forgiveness and healing there, 
that anyone who has been hurt in any way by the church would know that they are loved by you. And God, I just pray an outpouring from your people that whether they know it or not, that by encouraging the people around us, by taking an interest in the people around us, that those wounds might be healed because you are at work in us and among us. And Lord Jesus, we are so thankful that because of your death and resurrection that we celebrate in the Lord's Supper, that we have found grace, that our sin is no longer our nightmare, because you've taken it away and given us a new reality. Because we are all saved by grace, there is none of us that is higher or lower or better or worse, but we're all on the same plane. We all know God because of what Jesus has done for us. Lord, for anybody today that's still struggling with that that reality, struggling with that grace, struggling to know what it means for them. God, I just pray that you would make themselves known to them. Help them to see how much you love them, despite the times that they might feel like they don't need or deserve that love. God, we all need your love. We all need your grace. We all need your forgiveness. And when we realize that and confess our sins and come to you, You give us a new life. You give us a new relationship with you. You give us a new family of brothers and sisters in the church. You change our hearts. You change our lives. You change our eternity. And for this, Jesus, we humbly say thank you. Lord, we pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. For our final hymn, let's stand and sing number 366 in the blue hymnal and remain standing for the benediction. As you go, receive these words from Philippians chapter 2, where Paul writes, 
Therefore God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that was above every other name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. You are dismissed and go in peace. Thank you.